Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is The Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, The Behavioral Corner. Please, hang around a while. You know, it's been a spring like no other because of, well, pandemic. So we're taking a look at how that's impacted our behavioral health, our psyches, our emotions. So we're very excited to take a look at a big part of our lives that have been altered by this and what it all means. And that's, you know, the games we play and the games we watch, in particular, the effect on sports and sports fandom during this absence of games. Um, Now, we could have gone to academia, certainly this Subject has been studied by those pointy heads for years and years. They would have loaded us with data. It's the golden age of data. And that would have told us something for sure. We could have had clinicians in to talk to us about, you know, the way the frontal lobe lights up when, you you know, your team is in the red zone and fumbles. That, That would have been valuable. Or we could have dragged a grizzled sports writer away from their duties and gotten a real expert and a passionate view of of the topic sports and our relation to them. To that end, we are really happy to invite a a great friend uh, and a legend in in these parts of the country, Ray Didinger, an American sports writer. He is an author, a screenwriter, radio personality, sports commentator, uh, and not the least of which around here, he is noted uh, for his uh, position in Pro Football's Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. So as I said, if you want to find out what sports means on a very deep level, there's nobody better than, as we say around here, Ray Diddy. Hello, Ray. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on The Corner. Nice to join you, Steve. Always a pleasure. You know, I could spend the next 20 minutes with your uh, Emmy Award-winning uh, documentary work and the awards you've won for your work, but you're too modest to let me do that, so <laughs> let us jump right into it. You know, I, we spoke earlier. Uh, we As we sit here now, there there are plans afoot to bring the games back they are they are elaborate. They are detailed. They involve bubbles and testing and fans, no fans. That all could change by the time we get on the air. So we're we're speaking in this vacuum of of no games. It's been a very very peculiar spring for sports fans all over the country, all over the world, for that matter. Do I make too much of this when I talk about the psychological uh, or behavioral health aspect of? sports fans oh no no i think it's uh it's very real you know i mean in in our society especially um sports has always been the great release it's uh that's where everybody has gone to get away from their other problems to get away from the problems at work to get away from the problems in their personal life to get away from all that stress the easiest thing to do is either go to a game or just sit on the couch and grab the remote and flip on a game and it's um it, it that's kind of where you go to to get away from the other troubles and um and it's been that for generations and we've kind of grown up knowing that it was always going to be there and when we needed it it was it was a great source of comfort and now you know now that's taken away and uh can't tell you how many people that I've bumped into over these last what four months now that uh, say to me, and people I didn't even think were sports fans, and I don't really truly sports fans, but what they've said to me is, God, I miss it. I, you know, and I know exactly what they're saying. They don't, they don't have to go into much more detail than that. You know, God, I miss it. And I'm not even talking about the people that are, you know, that, that really breathe, eat, sleep, devour this stuff. You know, people that read all the box scores and know all the batting averages and, you know, can tell you every stat. I mean, I'm not talking about the people that are the true devotees. I'm talking about just the average guy, you know, that mm. he, he just he just grew up in a world where he knew it was always there. You know, there was always you pick up the you know turn on the TV and it was it was going to be there. Um, turn on the radio, it was going to be there. Uh, and now it's not. And there's a genuine sense of loss. And when as many things are happening in the world as are happening right now, which are confusing and troubling and and just hard to kind of get a handle on, you know, in, in, in other times we would have said, you know what, I need to get away. I'm going to watch a Phillies game tonight. Well, guess what? Phillies aren't there either. I think that um, from just that 
uh, I, I just kind of, kind of need to have something to grab onto. Uh, having lost that, I think is is a very real loss to to everybody. And you know, the people in the business, the people that are that are sports casters, sports writers, broadcasters, and all. I mean, it's I mean, it's your way of life has been taken away. And the problem is, the the real problem is nobody knows when it's coming back and in what form it's coming back. So. Um, you, you, I mean, you said it well at the beginning. These are these are times unlike any other, uh, and it cuts across all platforms. And sports is a real big part of that. Mm. You know, we, let's begin with the most obvious things about what sports are, and you mentioned it right there. They are a diversion. If they're nothing else, they are a diversion. I think that's right into the wheelhouse you're talking about. Even the casual sports fan will turn on a baseball game as he reads because it's it's company and it's soothing and it does take you away from the moment you know from like a um psychological point i don't want to get too academic here is this a time when we should be looking for diversion do you know what i mean sports is faced with this need to come back for sure to offer all that you talked about but to divert sure. but to divert us at a moment in time when I don't know, maybe we shouldn't be diverted. Maybe we should be concentrating on bigger issues than, gee, there's no baseball. How do you feel about that? Yeah, no, I, I know what you're saying. Uh, and I I think there's a, a distinction to be drawn because uh, I, I heard someone, I heard actually two guys having this debate one time, not that long ago about the idea that the sports is a great distraction. Uh, and uh, the other guy said, "Yeah, but with what's happening in the world right now, I don't think we need to be distracted. <laughs> you know, I think I think we need to pay attention yeah, right. to the issues that are right in front of us right now and resolve those. Uh, you know, being distracted isn't exactly what this is about. And I get that point of it, but I, I think there's a difference between diversion and just release and relief." You know, you can be fully engaged with what's happening to us as a society right now, and I think everybody should be. Yeah, I think by and large we are. And you can be that for a good portion of the day and be thinking about it and trying to do what each person can in their own way to make things better. And uh, the, the thing that I've always stressed is just what I really think you need to do, especially parents. You, I think it's desperately important that parents sit down and talk to their kids today. You know, take the Xbox away for an hour. You know, to take, put the cell phone down for an hour. And let's just sit at the kitchen table and talk about what's happening in the world. Because kids are getting just assaulted with, with images on TV and conversation. And and I, I think it's it's really critical that parents act like parents right now and, and sit down and tell the kids, look, this is what's happening in the world. Here's what we're dealing with. Here's what these people are saying. Here's what they're fighting for. You know, I think that conversation, that kind of understanding begins at home and then grows out from there. So I'm not saying that, that sports should take the place of that. But what I'm saying is that if if you do everything you can uh, in your in your workplace, in your family, all day long to be a good person and kind of set things right, there's nothing wrong at eight o'clock at night just sitting back and saying, Phew, you know what, uh, I need to just watch a ball game. Now. <laughs> right, exactly. you know, and that, that that doesn't make it doesn't make you negligent. It doesn't make you a bad person. Uh, it doesn't make you someone who's fleeing from reality. You're just somebody that needs a break. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. I, and I think so. That's that's why. I think there's a distinction between the idea of this as distraction slash diversion and just having a couple of hours in your day where you just kind of need a little bit of emotional release. Yeah, well put. I mean, yes, you can you can uh, take this apart a lot of ways, but you cannot remove that relief quotient, which which is what we're missing. The release right. of a game in all of its it may be complicated uh, on one level, but, you know, Sports, watching sports, really a very simple universe. The games are played in a confined space, easily easily delineated. There are clear rules most of the time. That You know, there are referees who tell you when mistakes are made. So it's a universe unto itself that offers you solace. You can go there and, like, cool out. Unfortunately, everything you just said has seeped into the game as well. I mean— now, when you introduce a kid to sports early on, they may say to you, why are some of those guys kneeling and why are they not? Has that real world behavior that seeped into sports across the board hurt people's fandom 
and emotional well-being and connection to the games, or is it just an inevitable consequence of the world we live in? Uh, I think it's probably both, Steve. It's it's certainly an inevitable part of the world we're living in now, a, a world where that kind of um, visual messaging is really important, where social activism is as great as it's ever been, if not greater. I mean, it's it's just impossible to imagine that that wouldn't cross over uh, and get into the, the sports culture to some degree, and it has. Yeah. And I think that I, I has, have some people turned their back on it and walked away and said, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't want to, you know, if that's what these players are going to do, if they're going to kneel, if they're going to disrespect the, the flag, I don't want anything to do with them anymore. Yeah, I think there has been. Uh, I, you know, I, think it, I think the number is smaller. I, I think it's smaller than people think. I think it's smaller than people say. But uh, have some people... I know some people that have just said, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not interested anymore. And, you know, that's kind of been there for a while. I mean, some people are kind of driven away by the money. Some people are just kind of driven away by what they see as just the, the, the sheer avarice and uh, elitism of the athletes and the owners that uh, I just don't want to root for these guys anymore. I don't like them the way yeah. I like the yeah, yeah. players of my youth. I, some of those people, yeah, I think they have been they have, they have sort of drifted away, but I think the number is relatively small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the love the game, hate the player uh, phenomenon, which we see more and, and, sure. more and more of. Well, let me ask you something. It's a, it's a grossly uh, overgeneralized question to ask anybody, but do you think guys who are really dedicated to watching the games and they enjoy it and all that, do you think they are in general happier than people who – don't watch sports as a no, concept. I think, I think, no, I think, I think everybody seeks out their own, their own bliss. You know, I mean, there, there's some people that just, you know, their idea of a wonderful Sunday is, is going over and watching a string quartet at the Curtis music Institute. That's where they find their pleasure. That's right. where they find their release, you know, and then, you know, there are other people that are just uh, activists, you know, that want to get on a bicycle and just ride. And some people that want to run, um, there are some people that deeply immerse themselves in, in, in community service. Uh, and then there are the other people that are like the people I grew up with in Southwest Philadelphia in my grandfather's bar that, I mean, their, their greatest source of enjoyment after they finish working at GE or Westinghouse or something is coming in my grandfather's bar, having a shot and a beer and watching a Phillies game. You know, that's where, you know, that's where they kind of find their enjoyment. I, you know, I think it's, uh, I don't know that they're happier necessarily. I think everybody finds their, how the, you know, finds their own sort of uh, place of happiness. But um, for the people, for the people that need that, for the people that have grown up with that, for the people that have, have accepted that as part of their way of life, you know, to have that taken away, you know, for the, for the last four months, I know has been really difficult. I, you know, every day I bump into somebody who, who tells me about, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do if, uh, you know, and boy, they're, they're sort of begging me as if I can bring these things back. Come on, come you know, on, tell Ray. Me, tell, you know, tell, you know, tell me baseball's coming back. Please tell me baseball's <laughs> coming. Please tell me, please tell me there's going to be a football season. And I, get to and work. I just shrug my shoulders. I don't, I don't know any better than you do. Yeah, get to work. You know, one of the other things uh, uh, sports uh, has historically done is it is a very primal bonding uh, method. It's a way uh, families pass on their enjoyment of, of the games and their teams. Um, everybody remembers the first game they were taken to and by whom. Sure. Do you uh, recall yours? Yeah, yeah. Phillies, Milwaukee Braves. Uh, my dad was away with the Air Force, so it was my grandfather that took me. But it was the Phillies, Milwaukee Braves. Yeah, Robin Roberts against Warren Spahn. And we had great seats, uh, lower deck, not quite box, but pretty close. This is Connie Mack uh, Stadium. Behind. Connie Mack Stadium, right? Yep. yep. Connie Mack Stadium. And um, I remember there weren't that many people in the stands, so we were able to kind of edge our way down and edge our way down to some of the empty seats down in the boxes. And uh, I still vividly remember literally being close enough, because this is how intimate Connie Mack Stadium was, being close enough that uh, we're sitting right by the railing, and when Henry Aaron – was in the on deck circle. I could literally see the perspiration on his neck. <laughs> Not the kind of experience you're going to get in big league ballparks today. But uh, when you talk about everybody remembers that first trip to the ballpark, yeah, I mean, I remember it in that much detail. Yeah, yeah. No one who who has had that experience uh, will ever forget coming up out of whatever tunnel you led out to the field and seeing. Something you'd seen on television, and in those days in black and white, perhaps. In black and white. And then this explosion of color, even in the old drab ballpark you're talking about, it was still startling. I remember it. You just stop. You don't even go to your seat immediately. You just stop at the head of that tunnel and look out at that field and go, oh, my God, it's real. 
takes your breath away. It does. It really does, and, and it st- and it stays with you your whole life. That first, uh, that first moment, because and I think it's it was it's more acute for people of our generation because we literally are introduced to the game on black and white TV. And you're right. You come out of the tunnel. It's dark. Uh, and then you walk up towards, and, and it was a night game for me, so you're, you're walking towards it and the overhead lights are all on. And then you step out into where you have a, the clear field of vision out onto the field. And you see the, the green grass and you see the scoreboard lights and you see the lights overhead. And, you know, the Phillies uniforms were really colorful, that thing, you know, that real cherry red color uniforms. And it was, I mean, I remember, I just remember my heart thumping. And I had the same yes. kind of experience mm-hmm. when I went to my first Eagles game, you mm-hmm. know, coming up, because that was Connie Mack Stadium, too. They hadn't yet moved to Franklin Field. And coming up the same tunnel, coming out the same walkway, uh, and being exposed to that, uh, now it was a gridiron, you know, and you had the, the green field with the white stripes, and band was out there playing, and it was, oh, God. I mean, it was it was really thrilling. Yeah. I, I really think that those I, those emotions and those sensations it just moved me so profoundly that uh, I think it has a lot to do with, with the career path I yeah, chose. There's you... nothing in my life that had happened at that point that had excited me more mm-hmm. than going to a baseball game and a football game. And I just said to myself, man, this is what I want to do. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do exactly, but whatever I want to do, I want to do it in this setting. Yeah, see if I can get as close to this as I can. If, yep. if I can't be on that field, let me see how close I can get to this. You know, it is a moment, that moment you talk about. Is uh, it's remarkable for a young mind that's being it's that's being formed in that moment. It can have a profound effect on the way your brain wires itself, uh, and that stays with you uh, going forward. I'm thinking right now of uh, families out there who had counted ahead and figured this would be the summer or the spring when we'd be able to take the kids to their first game, whatever it was, and they're going to lose that. Right. If we're, if we're talking about the impact of this thing, that is a diminishing effect. Yeah, it's genuine loss. It, it, it really is. And you can't replace it with really anything else. I mean, kids today, the younger generation today, I mean, my grandchildren, for heaven's sakes, I guess they replace it in some set because you know, everybody's playing Madden. Every, everybody's got games that they're playing in, in terms of video games, which I guess brings its own source of enjoyment and escape. There's nothing that replaces that, that physical feeling that you have when you actually walk into the stadium for the first time and you see the game for the first time. And I guess the best, one of the best parts about it, and I remember, is it is so communal in, in, in a way that a video game is, can never be. I mean, you're, you're in there and you're not just enjoying it yourself, but you're sharing it with thousands of other people. Uh, and in my case, a lot of relatives and, and people, the guys from my grandfather's bar who were like relatives, you know, you're there sharing it with them, too. Uh, and those are the memories that stay with you a lifetime. Mm. We, you know, it, that's another uh, aspect of the uh, behavioral health component and sports is that there's an incredible – I don't want to make too much of this because it can be a false notion. But there is a great leveling effect with regard to our civic lives when you're in a stadium. You know, I went to Franklin Field as a, as a youngster, as you did, and you would go in your seats. And no matter where they were, you could be sitting next to a doctor, a judge – a pipe fitter or or a cop and you wouldn't know it sure there there wasn't there were no distinctions we were all in in this thing together i wonder though psychologically and you've been to so many of these and you've talked to so many people in terms of our civic lives do the sports strengthen the civic bond or is it a false kind of community in other words yeah we can all be eagle fans but that doesn't mean we agree politically does it really strengthen us as civic animals uh, i think it does yeah i think i think it does because you're right i mean we're never as a society as a city as a nation we're never all going to agree on any one thing i mean it's just that's just not going to happen but i i think i think there's something underlying all the other differences that does hold you together there is that certain kind of understanding that uh okay you're a democrat i'm a republican but on Sunday afternoon at one o'clock, we're both Eagles fans, and that's that's one thing that does kind of hold you together. And I, you know, when you see it, when, when you see it as you saw it with Super Bowl Fifty Two, uh, the reaction in the city, I mean, that's real. You know, I mean, that's real. And what people were celebrating, I mean, I went to the parade on Thursday. I was in Minnesota, so I wasn't I wasn't here to see the actual. The, the moment the game ended, and the people poured into the streets to celebrate, but I certainly saw the pictures. And then Thursday, being at the parade, 
at the art museum and seeing what that was like, you know, what that looked like, what it sounded like, what it felt like. I mean, that was real. Mm. Um, and, and, and one of the things that um, I think exists in our society now, which is problematic, I think, is because of the way things are set up, and it's only been deepened now because of the pandemic, uh, is, this, is this kind of um, isolation that we all kind of live in, that we live in a world where, you know, we live, it seems like we live 90% of our days just staring into a computer screen. And we don't talk to each other as much. You know, nobody picks up a telephone anymore. Everybody sends an email. And I think in some ways, you know, in some ways, I think we're more isolated as a society. I think, you know, anything that draws people together is, is I think, a good thing. You know, I wrote an article a long time ago about, uh, uh, about this, this thing around the idea of Super Bowl and why I think Super Bowl is really important in the United States, in, the, in this country. I know in a lot of ways it's way overblown and it's, you know, it's become kind of this, this big waddling walrus of an event, you know, that's, it's sort of overhyped mm-hmm. and it's, and there's too much money spent and it's become too corporate and yada, yada, yada. I mean, you can talk about all the things that are wrong with it, but the one thing is that when it's played, you know, when they kick it off, it really becomes the great American campfire. You know, and whether you're a football fan or you're a man or you're a woman or you're young or you're old or you're black or you're white, you're watching. You know, you're engaged. You know, you're all sitting there watching the same thing. You probably have different rooting interests, uh, and you may not be all that big of a football fan. You don't know who the players are, but you're caught up in just this moment mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's collective. And it's collective in a way that very few things are collective in our society anymore. And so... That's why I do think that it's easy for sociologists to sort of say, oh, this is nonsense, it's, you know, poo-poo, the whole thing is, oh, it's just sports. It's, or, or as we, those of us that are in the sports writing, sports broadcasting community always hear, that's the toy department of life. You know, there's the real world that the rest of us live in that really matters. And then there's the sports, which is the toy department. Well, no, it's really all kind of one world. And they all kind of have to function together. And guess what? They all have their purpose. And I think the idea that, that, that teams and rooting interests and that kind of involvement, both physical and emotional, is real and it is important. And I would argue that maybe in the world we're living in now it might be more important than ever. Ray Didinger is an American sports writer, and those insights are the sort of thing that got him in the writer's uh, roll call of Pro Football's Hall of Fame. And Ray's hanging with us on the corner here, uh, wondering where... Joe DiMaggio has gone, and uh, when will he be back? At Retreat Behavioral Health, we believe in the power of connection and quality care. We offer comprehensive, holistic, and compassionate treatment from industry-leading experts. Call 855-802-6600 and begin your journey today. One of the other things about sport that's interesting and beneficial, I believe, and I really believe this, and I hear everything you say about it's easy to it's easy to get cynical about the way it's morphed over the years, but sports can not only uh, takes us out of where we are, but to someplace else. There is a transcendent moment. There can be actual transcendent moments when you see something during a game that is so wonderful, that fills you with so much joy, that you you really are transported. It's not it's not oh we scored hooray. It's as you say a Super Bowl victory or some other moment of an individual game or an event. Let me ask you. Let me ask you a tough question. Can I ask you for your number one transcendent moment where, where you literally left your body because of something you'd seen in a sporting event? Um, not, yeah, li- sure. not, liter- um, not literally left uh, left your body. No, 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 no. <laughs> but it's, but it, I mean, for me, it's an easy one. It's 1960 NFL championship game, Eagles Packers at Franklin Field, and my hero. My my true boyhood hero, Tommy McDonald, caught a touchdown pass to put the Eagles ahead in that game that they went on to win their last NFL championship prior to Super Bowl 52. And he caught it. We were Our seats were in section double E, which were in the end zone. And he caught the ball right in front of us. Uh, and you saw the whole play develop, saw Van Brocklin drop back, saw Tommy run the corner pattern, saw him beat the defensive back. I saw the ball in the air. And it felt like it was in the air for 
five hours. I mean, it, it felt like it felt like that ball hung in the air forever. And uh, you know, I knew Tommy was going to catch it because he never dropped a pass. And uh, <laughs> and he caught it. And the, the defensive back uh, shoved him in the end zone. And Tommy tumbled out of the end zone into a big patch of snow. The crowd came out of the stands and picked him up. And and he ran back onto the field. And the Eagles were ahead in the game. And at that point, there wasn't a doubt in my mind that they were going to beat the Lombardi Packers and win the NFL championship. And my hero not only scored the go-ahead touchdown, but he scored it practically in my lap. Wow. Yeah, you talk about a moment where you just kind of feel elevated and you just kind of feel like you leave your own body for a second and yep. go to another place. Nope. Yeah, that's that's it for me. Well, you know, I was at that game and I had <laughs> a half a dozen of those moments. The one that stands out most, though, is that we were late getting to the game. We were, we were a little late. I, it's a long story about waking up that morning very sick and um and the doctor <laughs> our family physician said bring him over <laughs> bring him <laughs> over so he, i'll never forget him saying uh well you're not you how are you feeling can you sit through a football game and i'm i'm faking it and he says look we're going to give you this and you take this at the halftime and you take this and he's not going to die there he's just you know he'll he'll forget all about it and then he looked at me and said ray after all, you may never get to see another championship game again. This is 1960, mm-hmm. and I remember thinking to myself very clearly, I hope he knows more about medicine than he does about football, because obviously <laughs> we were going to win 12 championships. And lo- sure, that was how we all felt. So God bless Dr. Carreri over in uh, Merchantville, New Jersey. But I do remember crossing the South Street Bridge and hearing the player announcements filled with both anxiety because we were late, but awed at how the bridge was shaking from the sound of the crowd inside the stadium. So that for me yep. was, was, a, was a peak moment. But I got to tell you something. I say this all the time. For me, the, the absolute max moment when, when I was just transported, and this sounds crazy to people who love team sports, I know. It's when Secretariat won the Belmont Stakes. <laughs> I, I, you know, you rarely get to see anything in life that is perfect, so perfect it defies – what you're looking at. And it's hard to tell people who don't like horse racing what, what that means, but I think you understand. It was, a mo- oh, sure. it was a moment that was beyond, almost beyond belief, and you were watching it. Sports can do that. They, they, they do it yeah. routinely, and now we don't have it. Yes, exactly. And that's, and, you know, and that's why uh, it's moments like that that are, that are very special in, in anybody's life. And you know, I am the farthest thing from a horse racing aficionado. I'm, I'm really not. I, I know very little about it. I don't really understand it. I, I couldn't tell you all the Triple Crown winners. I, I'm, not, I'm not, nor do I pretend to be Dick Girardi. But um, <laughs> even I, when I saw what happened at the Belmont and I saw a secretariat just pull away from those other horses, great horses, all of them, and just become kind of this almost magical kind of transportive figure. Yeah, I mean, I can I can absolutely relate to that, and that's and that's kind of what sports does. You know, Jim Murray, the uh, the the great columnist from the L.A. Times, the uh, first sports writer ever to win the Pulitzer Prize, once wrote and he he did a, a sort of a farewell to sports writing when he was retiring. And he dealt with this whole idea that, you know, he had spent his whole life writing about sports and there were certain people in the newspaper business and in journalism that kind of, even as good as he was, just kind of looked at him. Yeah, 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 you're, you're good, but you're a sports writer, you know, and, you know, you're not, you know, you're not an editorial writer. You're not a, you know, you're not a guy that's writing cover stories for Time magazine. You know, you, you know, you're in your own little playground and that's fine for what it is. But, and Jim kind of, I remember him writing that. That if you're if you're a fan of a team or you're a fan of a player, that it's very easy. You know, people will look at you disdainfully and say, "Get a life." And what Murray said was, "Well, you know what? I got a life. You know, <laughs> and this is what it is. And that to say that it's not important, or to say that by that that I don't have your life. Well, maybe I don't. But the fact is that I have this life, and it's real, and it's important to me. Uh, and in this arena, I know that I'm good at what I do. And there are a lot of people that get enjoyment out of it. And there's a great book that was done by uh, a guy named Jerome Holtzman, uh, who was a baseball writer for the Chicago Tribune. And he went around and he interviewed a whole bunch of old sports writers who were at that point retired uh, about the glory of their times uh, and what they had seen and how they felt about their lives. 
it was really an oral history. There was it was just basically his interviews with these guys. But to read you know Red Smith talking about what he did, and and you know Jimmy Cannon, and uh, all the all the true giants of sports journalism. Is these were great journalists. Yes. I mean these were the, I mean these were journalists that were the equal of any news journalist. They were just performing in a different arena, and the way they talked about what they did, and the passion that they had, and what they brought to their job. The the beauty of it was that it never got old for them. I mean, they were as hungry and they were as enthusiastic and, and, and they were as engaged with what they were writing the day they walked away from the job as they were the day they came in as a cub reporter. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of beauty and, and truth in that. Yeah. And you know what? Jimmy Cannon is a, a hero of mine for sure. Cannon hung out with Hemingway. Hemingway admired Jimmy Cannon. So tells you about his skill as a, as a, as a writer. But Cannon said, among many other things, that shows you how – how important this stuff can really be psychologically. When talking about Joe Lewis in, in, the, in the moment, he was always referred to as a credit to his race. Yep. Uh, they, they were the times. Cannon went further and said, yes, the human race, which I thought was – Exactly right. Was, uh, exactly right. It's one of, it's one of, it, it stands as one of the great lines of all time. Mm-hmm. And, and Cannon is not regarded as a great wordsmith, but he was. His writing was beautiful in the sense that it was um, – he wrote at a level that he wrote to the common man. I mean, the, you know, the cab driver, mm-hmm. uh, the, the cop on the beat. I mean, they could read Jimmy Cannon and enjoy him as much as a university professor. He, he spoke with a clarity and a universality that was just – it was a unique form of eloquence yep, that he it brought was. to it. Yeah. And, and I, I thought that uh, – I remember reading it – was, it was kind of I, – I sat next to him uh, at um, – my first AFC championship game that I covered when I was at the Philadelphia Bulletin, it was January of 71. And I walked into the press box at uh, Baltimore Memorial Stadium. The, the Colts were still in Baltimore then. And I walked down the aisle and I looked and I saw, and I had this, I'd been given a seat next to Jimmy Cannon. I thought, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I'm going to cover a championship game and I'm going to be sitting next to Jimmy Cannon. And I remember when I sat down, he put his hand out, he shook hands with me, and he said, you're Philadelphia, huh? Philly, I love it. Great fight town. And <laughs> and, and we, we talked the whole game. And he, he ta- I remember him telling me, he said, you know, my two favorite – and I told him, I said, you know, I've, admired, I've read you for years. I really admire your work. Uh, you know, he's the guy that really kind of created the, the, what they call the notes column. Right. I mean, nobody, he, nobody, he asked, that thing. nobody asked me but. Right. Nobody asked me but dot, dot, dot. Yep. And uh, I mean, everybody does notes columns today, but Jimmy was the first one. And we, and we had a very far-ranging conversation that day over the course of the game. Uh, and I remember him saying that his two favorite people that he dealt with in sports, and he, and he said in life, the two best men I've ever met were Joe Lewis and Joe DiMaggio. He hmm. said those. He said those are my buddies. He said, "I got to tell you, kid, I can't be objective when I write about those two guys because they're my friends." He said, <laughs> "But they're special, yes. and I, I'll always remember that day." Yeah, Can, Cannon's, a, Cannon's a legend. Ray, Ray, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna do what you mentioned. Uh, so many people uh, are doing to you every day now, and uh, ask you to look into your Hall of Fame crystal ball. All the major sports, uh, certainly basketball and football. Um, baseball in particular, deep into discussions about how the game will come back. And we're not going to go into the details of that because it's exhausting. But what do you think? I mean, are we going to see a baseball this year? Are we going to see football in the fall? I mean, a lot of people are assuming football is coming back in September. What's your take? I think it's going to start. I just don't know if it's going to finish. Uh, and I, I say that about all the sports. One of the things that scares me now is that I think there's so many people around where I live, around the country, I guess, really, truly, that kind of think COVID's over. They go, yeah, we whipped it. It's done. Uh, We're back to life as normal. Uh, And, uh, I mean, the area where I live, um, I mean, a couple weeks ago, everybody was wearing masks. Now, not that many people are. You know, people aren't observing the social distancing. Places are opening, which is fine, but I just don't know if they're opening safely. And the numbers are out there that are showing you that this thing is coming back in other areas of the country. Uh, I just don't know that that the experts, uh, that the Dr. Fauci's of the world, have this thing nearly as well under control as people seem to think that they do. So my great fear is that, yeah, the hockey teams are going to come back. They're coming back on a limited basis already now, just some, some smaller training camps. Basketball already has their game plan for how they're all going to convene down in Florida and get this season underway. And, you know, baseball... You know, the the commissioner who can't seem to get out of his own way, but he does have the authority to unilaterally decide at a certain point that, yeah, we're coming back and we're going to start having games. I mean, all of this stuff is on the table now, and there are really plans that it's going to happen. 
But my great fear, Steve, is that they're going to come back and they're going to be back for a few weeks and then guys are going to start testing positive and more guys are going to start testing positive and then more guys are going to start testing positive and then you're going to have a quarantine is going to be put in effect and then teams are going to be put on the shelf and at a certain point the the people that run the leagues are just going to throw their hands up and say forget it we'll we'll see in 2021 i i think that every i think they're going to try to get everything underway and i think they're on their way to getting everything underway but i just don't know that it's going to be able to make it through to a conclusion well you know what Um, from a psychological standpoint and from a behavioral health perspective fans had better steal themselves for that. We're all going to be excited and euphoric when the games do come back whenever, but there is that that danger. Look, researchers have been uh, interested for a very long time in the, the characteristic habits and uh, the overall health of sports fans, and they've looked at alcohol consumption. They've done studies on testosterone levels rising and falling, cardiac arrest rates uh, after a Super Bowl game. So this is a, this is a well-traveled uh, path that we've been discussing here today. But boy, we couldn't have gotten anybody better than than you to uh, talk to us about what sports mean to us psychologically. Ray Didinger, you must be dying to get back into the press box, right? <laughs> I truly am. I truly am. And, uh, you know, I'm really hoping that uh, they can get the football thing started because I, um, you know, I just, I just, I just miss it so much. You know, I mean, the networks, the local networks and the national networks, I mean, they've been They've been putting a lot of old games on the air, and that's fine to a point. You know, I mean, I, I can watch old games. I can watch the Phillies World Series win again. That's fine. But, you know, Steve, I, I sit there and I watch it, and after about a half an hour, it, it, I feel, it starts to make me sad. Because all it does is it reminds me of what I'm missing. Yeah. You know, I, I know everybody thinks it's kind of, I know that the idea is it's kind of filling the void. But it makes me sad because it real, I realize it just reinforces how much I'm missing. So I can't wait to get back to the real stuff. And uh, and I know I'm not alone in feeling that. Yeah. Well, no, you're not. And, you know, uh, around the world, the uh, game of uh, football, soccer, is referred to as the beautiful game. And that's true of all of these games. Once you get past all the nonsense and the big business and the money, it is a beautiful thing, and it's, it's important to us uh, psychologically. Ray, thanks for reminding us of it all. It was my pleasure, Steve. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. That's it for now. And make us a habit, hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, on the Behavioral Corner. 